Let's turn now to the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 44. We have there an exposition on the Tenth Commandment and on the whole law of God. Lord's Day 44, this is page 558 in the Heidelberg Catechism. What does the Tenth Commandment require of us? That not even the slightest thought or desire contrary to any of God's commandments should ever arise in our heart. Rather, with, our, rather, with all our heart, we should always hate all sin and delight in all righteousness. But can those converted to God keep these commandments perfectly? No. In this life, even the holiest have only a small beginning of this obedience. Nevertheless, with earnest purpose, do they begin to live not only according to some, but to all the commandments of God. If in this life no one can keep the Ten Commandments perfectly, why does God have them preached so strictly? First, so that throughout our life, we may more and more become aware of our sinful nature and therefore seek more eagerly the forgiveness of sins and righteousness in Christ. Second, so that while praying to God for the grace of the Holy Spirit, we may never stop, stop striving to be renewed more and more after God's image until after this life we reach the goal of perfection. After the sermon, we will sing in response to the proclamation of the gospel, hymn 74, stanzas 1, 2, 3, and 4. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, well, we are at the last commandment in our in working our way through the law of God using the template of the Heidelberg Catechism. We get to the last commandment here, the 10th commandment. What is that commandment all about? We're instructed to, or we're forbidden from coveting. Do not covet. Do not set your desire some translations put it that way. Do not set your desire. And then there's a list of things that we're not supposed to set our desires upon. And in the Ten Commandments in Exodus that we heard this morning, that list of things are all things that belong to someone else. They are our neighbor's possessions. Do not set your desire on or do not covet your neighbor's house, wife, servants, ox, ox donkey, and then, or, or anything else. If something belongs to your neighbor, do not covet it. In short, we're not supposed to desire what God has given to another person. And we can understand this. After all, we can pretty quickly make the connection between having a desire for something that belongs to our neighbor, and then acting in a way that harms our neighbor. It's an immediate connection there. Think of some examples from the scriptures. We actually mentioned this one last week in connection with the ninth commandment, bearing false witness. King Ahab, how did that all start? He coveted, he set his desire on Naboth's vineyard, and what did that lead to? That desire for the vineyard led to the sins of bearing false witness. It led to, ultimately, the sin of murder, the murder of Naboth. It ended his life. We see the same thing with King David. David desired Bathsheba, Uriah's wife, and that led to David's adultery with her. And then again, eventually, it led to the act of murder. It resulted in the end of Uriah's life. But is that the extent of the purpose of the 10th commandment? 
There are all these other commands about how we are supposed to treat our neighbor, right? We honor those in authority over us. We protect our neighbor's life and his well-being. We help to guard their possessions and their reputation, right? Those are commandments 6 through 9. And then the 10th commandment is, you know, giving us precautionary measures, like just to make sure you don't get started down that road of terrible sin. Is that what's going on? Well, that's certainly part of it. But it's much deeper. It's much broader. The scope includes everything. It's not just a preventative measure to keep the neighbor from being harmed, but the 10th commandment addresses the very root, and that is the heart's desires themselves. In Lord's Day 44, we confess that the 10th commandment requires that not even the slightest thought or desire, not even the slightest, not even an inkling, this is question and answer 113, that not even the slightest thought or desire, contrary to any of God's commandments, should ever arise in our hearts. Very strong language, and it covers everything everything. God gives a command about the desires of our hearts. Not only whatever desires may arise in our hearts for our neighbor's things, for his stuff, but he gives us a command about every desire that we would ever have. God cares about our hearts. He cares about where we place our affections, the things that we love and adore, it is a sin against God personally to have a desire, even just a desire that is ungodly or unholy. And he wants us, he commands us to desire only what is right. In the 10th commandment, we are commanded to have the desire in our hearts to do right all the time. We'll see two aspects of, of that command concerning the heart's desire. Number one, the impossibility for sinners to keep this command perfectly. But then secondly, on the other hand, the promise of a good beginning in it. So point one, the impossibility for sinners to keep this command perfectly. Now most of us are quite familiar, maybe very familiar, with the way that Jesus Christ, during his Sermon on the Mount, exposed the need that all sinners, all of us, have for the forgiveness of sins. Do you remember what he taught about the commandments, especially adultery and murder? Jesus taught that if, if anyone thinks that they'll be able to stand before God on the day of judgment and that they're going to be judged just on the shallowest superficial letter of the law and that they would be declared by God to be perfectly righteous and deserving of heaven, then that person is sorely mistaken. Right? If anyone says, you know, I have never committed the physical acts of fornication or adultery, or I have never committed the act of murder. I've never ended the life of another human being. So I'm good regarding those commandments. I'm innocent regarding these commands. Jesus says, if that's what you think, then you have to think again. God will be evaluating all our lives according to his perfect law. And guess what? Every single human being, apart from God's intervention, would be found guilty and face condemnation. Jesus says this in Matthew 5, 21 and 22, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Of course, that's true. But I say to you, these are the words of Jesus, I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Just being angry with your neighbor, your brother, your sister, detesting them in your heart, 
Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, or you idiot, calls their brother stupid, they will be liable to the hell of fire. And he says similar things about the seventh commandment. So you haven't actually physically committed adultery. Okay. Jesus says, however, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Both sinfulness and righteousness, they're not only about outward acts, but they have to do with the desires of our hearts. So, week after week, when we hear the Ten Commandments and we're meditating about our need for forgiveness, and we're contemplating the ways that we have transgressed God's law, let's be instructed by our Lord Jesus Christ. Our tendency, of course, we know this, our tendency is to want to think the best of ourselves and to give ourselves a pass here and there, to think that, you know, there are commandments that maybe we haven't broken in the past week. But Jesus is teaching us the truth, really the truth, about our need before God. We have all had desires contrary to all of God's commandments. And so without his help, without his forgiveness, all are guilty of breaking the law of God. Why do we need to know this? We must understand this, or we will not understand how deeply we need to humble ourselves before God because of our sins. We need to understand how desperately, how desperately we all need the forgiveness of all our sins. There is nothing that we could do to get ourselves out of the mess of sin. How often do we think of that? How often does that break our hearts? How horrible the thought would be if there was nothing done about this. Look at the first part of question and answer 112. Or sorry, 115. Pardon me. Why do we need to hear the law of God all the time? So that throughout our life we may more and more become aware of our sinful nature. What does that do? causes us to seek more eagerly the forgiveness of sins and righteousness in Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is so much more beautiful to us, so much more precious in our hearts and in our eyes when we understand what he has saved us from. When we are truly taught how great our sins are, well, then the cross of Jesus Christ, onto which all of our sins were nailed and, and dealt with completely, that cross of Jesus Christ is that much more wonderful news to us. And it brings us tears of joy. What a Savior. What a Savior we have. And now, how thankful we are for that salvation and for the promise of new desires in our hearts. God promises a good beginning in having hearts that desire to do right. So yeah, we see in the first part there that, yes, God considers it a sin. It's a sin when we even have a thought or desire contrary to any of his commandments, and we accept that. It's okay, if God says that it is, then it is. And we should be troubled about that when we, when we do sin and seek forgiveness for that. But why is that the case? Why does God so strictly judge the desires of our hearts, especially when they don't actually lead to outward acts of sin? Why is that? Why are our desires so important to God? Well, it's because the greatest command that is given is what? It is to love. 
It is to love the Lord our God and then to one another. The greatest commandment has to do with the condition of the heart. Why would God be pleased if, if you didn't love him at all, but instead, you know what, you tried to follow his commands, but doing it out of fear and in order to secure for yourself a good outcome? Would God be pleased with that? Of course not. Think about it this way. I think I've used this example before. If you go and visit someone in the hospital, you know, it's someone that you know, a friend of yours is very sick, they have just had a, you know, a horrific accident and they're in terrible pain and they need to be comforted, and you go and visit that person in the hospital, and they love that you're there, and they say, thank you so much for visiting me and spending time with me. How do you think they would react if your reply to that was, well, you know, to be honest, I didn't really want to come. I I had a lot of other things that I wanted to do. I actually don't want to be here, but, you know, it's the right thing to do. It's my duty, and that's why I came. Of course you'd be hurt by that. This person doesn't love you, but, but only wants a clear conscience for themselves and, and, you know, pat themselves on the back. I did the right thing. You know what? Don't even bother. Don't even bother with such an unloving gesture. That's what this is about. It's about the heart. God has designed us to be in a relationship of love with him. We are designed to be completely smitten with God, with our whole heart and soul and mind. This is who we're supposed to be. We are to be overcome with adoration and delight for God because that's who he is and and that is what's fitting for him. Our hearts were designed to be unstoppably drawn to God, attracted to Him in the most delightful way. That's what our hearts are for. That's what our hearts are for. What a beautiful thing that is. And the commandments, every single commandment that God has given, they are all expressions of that love and delight for God that should pour out of our hearts. So to have a desire against one of his commands, what is that? That's a turning away of the heart from God to to something else. It's a rejection. It's a rejection of the love of God. And we're prone to that. We're prone to that according to our sinful nature. But God is recreating our hearts through the work of the Holy Spirit so that these These wonderful desires for God, they're being restored. We lost them. They were gone. But God is restoring our hearts to that condition of love for him. Romans 7 is a passage that describes this intense struggle of the life of the Christian who has been redeemed and who is in the process of being renewed. What does Paul say about about himself in this Process of sanctification. What does Paul say about his own desires? Verses 15 through 18. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want. Paul has a desire in his heart to do what is right. He wants to obey the law of God because he recognizes how good it is and he wants to do that. I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Paul's heart is in a condition now of hating sin. It's disgusting to him. He doesn't want to do it. But he says, I do it. I do the very thing I hate. Verse 16, now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. This is the old sinful nature that clings to us. And this is very important. It clings to us against our will. We don't want it there. 
For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. That's what we confess in question and answer 114. Can those converted to God keep these commandments perfectly? Who are we talking about? These are Christians who are saved, whose sins are forgiven in the sight of heaven. No, they can't keep, we can't keep them perfectly. We only have a small beginning, and yet we begin to live not only according to some, but to all the commandments of God. Yes, we fight against temptation. And yes, we are discouraged, aren't we? When we slip, when we fall, when we sin. But what is the prevailing condition of the heart? The heart that you have now. This is beautiful, isn't it? This is not the heart that you were born with by nature. You've been given a new heart. God has given the gift of hearts that now want, really want to do what is right. This is the gift of God's grace, the renewal of your heart and the cleansing of your desires. Verse 22 of Romans 7, For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. We sang those two beautiful stanzas from Psalm 19. This song of adoration about the law of God. The law of God is sweeter than honey. What a delight we have in the things that God has commanded. Yes, indeed. We recognize now the beauty and the perfection of the law of God. Oh, that we could live perfectly according to this. How his commands are such lovely, sweet expressions of love for God and love for each other. And we truly do want to do these things. This heart is the gracious gift of God. We do have times of discouragement when we sin. Can't believe we did it again. That thing that we hate the thing that just stabs us in our hearts. We hate that sin, and so we want to do what is right. Be comforted. Be comforted, first of all, with what the Apostle Paul says in verse 20. If I do what I do not want, it is no no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. No sin or weakness that still remains in you against your will can prevent you from the gracious gifts of God. So people of God, train your hearts. Train your hearts with the gracious help of God so that your desire for Him grows, flourishes. Train your hearts to hate sin more and more and to be repulsed by it. Ask God constantly for this gift of grace. The gift of creating in you more and more a heart that loves God above all else. Where we can truly, with with hearts that are overflowing, sing the songs that we've been singing this afternoon about our love for God and our delight in His ways. Ask your Father in heaven to give what he has promised to give. A heart that loves him and adores him above all else. A heart that wants to express that love according to all that he has commanded. All of his wonderful commands. God has given you a new heart. Delight in God day after day. Amen.